Um, I'm just going to open with a few introductory slides with the quick has, uh, history of the technical side of the D process. So, in 2001, the first forum post about D appeared. A few months later, the first version of D was released. Truly, uh, D's fame precedes it. D stress was one of the first projects by Thomas Kuchner, which pre precedes the auto tester. It, it was a test suite of uh, test cases which uh, verified for regressions. Not, it appeared in 2004, and not long later, DSource appeared, which was our very own source forge for D projects. In 2006, the first bug was filed on Bugzilla. In 2007, D, version, D reached version 1.0. Truly a momentous moment, and frankly, I can't really tell which of these is the killer feature which justified this <laughs> version bump. <laughs> the first commit in version control was in, what was it, 2007. We were using subversion at the time, and it was hosted on DSource. Brad's auto tester did its first pull, uh, test on, in 2010. This was the start of our automated regression testing. Before that, it was mostly manual. Uh, the first pull request on GitHub was in 2011. I understand that the move to GitHub has really opened the floodgates for contributions, and it really increased the involvement of the community in, de in the development of the language. And in 2012, some guy I've never heard of created this forum software. <laughs> and a lot of other amazing stuff happened. And that's where we are now. So in the yeah, words yeah. of our benevolent architect, <coughs> destroy. <laughs> so that's where we are. Um, one of the first questions that I think I'd like to ask is who we are. And for people here that haven't met uh, the four of you, and also for people on the live stream, I have an introductory challenge for you. I'd like you each to introduce yourself in 64 bits. Bytes. <laughs> 64. One catch That was close, line. right? <laughs> you want to start, Walter? I'm Walter Bright. Uh, I started the language in 1999. I'm Martin Novak. I care about release, the compiler, and a bit of the runtime. I'm Vladimir Pantelev. I've been using DC in 2006. I maintain the forum software, the wiki, and a few other stuff. Um, hi, I'm Andre Alexandrescu. Um, I've been working on this since 2006. So you know who they are. I want to <laughs> check the audience and see if anybody has a question right. already burning a hole in their mind. Yeah, we got one in the back. Is that Stefan? So what I'm wondering is if you're a newbie and you want to get started with contributing to the sort of D framework, whether it be the runtime, the compiler, or Phobos, how do you find a good beginner task to get started with? Uh, we found when people ask for tasks, we suggest tasks and they don't do them. People do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to look at the stuff and decide what floats your boat and go with that, because uh, suggesting tasks to people just um, historically is just has never worked. So find something that interests you, interests you enough that you want to spend the time on it to do it and contribute that way. But he just destroyed that because he suggested that, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's like an explosion of paradox right now. <laughs> Maybe it's about strength finding. Everybody in the room has a different specialty. And how do you find that? Yeah, like some people like assembly language, some people don't. I like assembly language, so I know Martin does too. So uh, <laughs> generally, when there's some assembly that needs doing, it's a Mark Karai. <laughs> question. So I have a two-part question. Um, for one thing, Debugging is incredibly difficult with D because of a few really weird decisions, like exceptions being caught instead of causing a core dump. And I found this nice variable in the D runtime, which you can, if you could, 
set it to false, it wouldn't catch exceptions, it's just that you can't, because um, your code only is reached after it's read, which is kind of like, I felt like someone played a joke on me. <laughs> um, but I created a pull request to fix that, and it is successfully ignored so far for about a month. And I'm just curious how the process would be to not get ignored. Did, did you understand? Right. So well, I, I only partly understood the, the question about the sections thing. Um, I think that's my area of expertise in the runtime. Um, and what you just suggested sound kind of interesting, but I didn't fully get it. The voice we, of his question was about uh, what can lead to a pull request being ignored? Yes. Uh, what can happen to cause this? So that's the second part of the question. And well, we are notoriously very bad at maintaining our GitHub repo. So we have like, I think there was a number, like 300 open pull requests at the moment. And well, part of the reason is we can't work on anything if we're only reviewing pull requests. So um, for example, we did this huge import change, which was like bugging people for 10 years in about one and a half week of intensive work. And the problem is you cannot, you cannot work on anything if you're getting like input and information all the time. So it's like the main problem I personally have and I think a lot of other people have and Walter gets probably 10 times as much emails as I do and I also work part-time on something completely unrelated to these so it's like really challenging for us to work on all the pull requests. Um, I agree, I have a, a one track mine and it's, it's almost uh, painful to pull out of that and dive into something else that's completely different. So, you know, I tend to, you know, work on one thing and work on it and ignore everything else. And, um, you know, I apologize for things being ignored, but it's, it, it's been a long-standing complaint and I don't really have a good solution of that, except, you know, when sometimes it helps to uh, get on the news group and say, you know, what about this pull request? It's really cool. You know, do a little marketing of it. You know, it does kind of help. So maybe something that, because it's a really huge problem for us, um, so some things we try to do is, um, well, we, we need to actually scale up people that can review pull requests, have knowledge about the code, and can, well, can review your code, even it's, though it's my expertise, that area, right? I need, so I, we need to lose this ownership of certain areas. So like, it's not possible that Walter is the only person that can do something in Optlink, for example. And um, the reason was, the, the thing I've tried for like the last one or two years is actually collaborating more with per people on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. So I have certain peers where I know they're interested in doing this and that and trying to help them to get around hurdles and issues because I know they want to do the right or well, very important topics. They want to work on very important topics. For example, I've collaborated with Benjamin Taut a lot on this import-export thing and while I couldn't help him with all the thing and all the, give him all the support he needed, he came up with a really impressive solution by his own, on his own. Um, and that's, so I'm, I'm trying to enable people to do work more than, um, yeah, in order to scale up a bit on everything else. I've that's also it. noticed there's an effect on if the pull request is easy to review. And if you submit a pull request that combines a whole bunch of things into one large pull request. It's complicated, it's hard to review, and we have a tendency, ah, I'll look at that later, which uh, kind of goes on and on and on. So the more, the tighter the pull requests are, the more focused they are, the more obvious they are, what they're doing, the more likely they're gonna get reviewed quicker and pulled. If you for example, change three lines of code substantively and include a reformatting of 50 lines, um, it's likely to get ignored for a while before somebody's willing to sort through all the reformatting to find out what the actual change was. So uh, really smaller, tight, focused, one topic only pull requests tend to go through faster than 
having a whole bunch of topics and a bunch of other stuff thrown into a pull request, those tend to likely get, well, maybe I'll look at this later kind of reaction to them. What do you think, Vladimir? Have you well, considered splitting uh, like uh, Phobos into multiple places? Could you, so could you speak up, please? Speak up. Uh, hey. So, have you considered uh, splitting up Phobos uh, into multiple smaller repositories? So each smaller repository could be owned by uh, certain people and mm -hmm. what benefits and uh, disadvantages? So, like specialization. So, well, one way is to split, but alternative one, we can introduce the notion of owner's files. So that if your pull request touches a specific file, um, we can easily see who is sort of owning that file, so you can direct your pull request to that person. That I think like, that's not yet in most big projects anyway. I agree completely, and it's something that we are going to explore. Um, there often are pull requests to code that I wrote, and I found about it a month later, and I would be totally uh, chuffed to review that pull request, but I'm just not notified because I can't keep track of all the pull requests. Right. So some kind of automatic notification when someone edits the code that you have committed, that's something that we want to explore. Well, yeah, that's, that's really awesome. I mean, another thing is we have very few people working on the runtime, a lot more on Phobos, so that works better. But if you mention sections, then that's code that I wrote, and if I had gotten an email about this, I would have probably reviewed it within two minutes. Right. So. So let, let me summarize um, sort of the issues that I think um, have been mentioned. So one is use simple social uh, tactics, if you wish. For example, I always respond to my email. Like, I, like literally, I respond all of my email. It's, it's just the latency that's the problem, right? It's the, the, you know, I may answer your email from 2010. Um, <laughs> but it's my inbox until I solve it. I answer and I archive. So it's been very successful by some people. They said, you know, I'm really, I really want you to look at this. I'm blocked in it, and it's a, I think it's a good contribution I'm going to do. You know, uh, let me know. So that was extremely successful. Um, another thing is uh, there's a lot of, you know, we need to educate uh, con contributors better. Uh, I think it's uh, very worthwhile, and it's, it's good time well spent by uh, any, any of uh, us for and any of you guys who are the, among those among you who are more experienced, it's, um, it's a very good goal to sit down and work with someone on making their work better. It's much easier to lambast a bad pull request than working to make it better, right? It's, uh, so this is the noble pursuit to actually sit down with the contributor and say, you know, this is not good. It should be done, done like that, and et cetera. So co collaborate with them toward uh, better pull requests because then, you know, all the story with the fish and fishing, right? Um, so that's uh, definitely a thing. What I spend mo my, most of my time when I'm reviewing code is deciding whether this is good or bad because most of the time it's just okay. And again, as I said in my keynote, I, I want your exceptional work. I don't want your okay work. And sometimes I want to sit down with a person and kind of, um, you know, help them toward uh, making a better pull request and better pull request in the future. I think that's a very good thing. Of course, there's not always time for this, which makes for the, for the backlog. Um, the, the, the key here is to scale up. Scale up means automation, right? Scaling up means uh, things like uh, educating more people to actually become themselves valuable contributors who are able to uh, get uh, other people's pull requests and get, you know, essentially like snowball the whole, the whole thing. And uh, again, simple social tactics, they work very well. What, is there anything in place, I know there are meetups in some cities, but is there anything in place where people who want to scale up can? Are there, are there ever uh, virtual or video calls or um, other kind of groups where, where people can, can get the encouragement and, and any well, training you know, they might need? Yeah, our henchman in the B Foundation, Alice Hreli, he's organizing a meetup in San Francisco, which is how often? Uh, monthly, but it's more like Silicon Valley. It's a Silicon, sorry, a Silicon Valley uh, meetup every, uh, every month. So if you're from Europe, you should take a flight there and meet for an afternoon, <laughs> have a beer, go back. <laughs> Maybe there's and a way I, to make it digital. And definitely, I've been, essentially, I've been online uh, once. I'm, I'm not sure how much they liked it. I loved it. It was great. Um, so it's definitely something to keep in mind. It's a, it's, a good, it's a good thing to just meet face to face. I mean, I can't believe how many meetings I've had with you guys uh, these two, day, two one and a half days. Uh, and I've solved issues that took us like 
70,000 emails back and forth to the debate, right? So that was amazing. Um, so a question for Andre. Uh, last year, you, uh, paraphrasing here, said to stop complaining about the language and build awesome things with it. I was just wondering how you feel about how that's panned out over the last year. <laughs> stop complaining about the, uh, Actually, I think it panned out pretty well. Um, qualified success. Um, I think there's been a lot of, um, and actually, you know, a lot of uh, the industrial users here in, in this room um, have told me that actually, you know, it, it does happen that uh, much more than in the in the past that you 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 put a piece of really uh, difficult um, code through through the compiler and it it passes with flying cars and does something non-trivial and very interesting. So I think. Um, I think we've done a huge, um, a huge step forward in terms of quality. Of course, it's not there yet because, for example, there's still like I'm, I'm seeing like these uh, these very nice, interesting corner cases by Timon, and um, you know a, b a bunch of issues uh, that still exist. Uh, but I do think there's been a there's been a better. Um, uh, we're doing better than last year this time. Uh, another thing that has happened is. Um, which I want to take credit for a bit. I don't have envy, but I do have a bit of pride there. So um, <laughs> there, there's one thing. Um, I, I think in the past few months, things have improved on the forum, on the online forum, which is like the forum is very important for the community. Everybody who wants to do anything is going to hop on the forum and, I don't know, swear at someone, right? I'm kidding. It's not, there's not a lot of swearing, but there's just, you know, there's a lot of debate. In the, I made the executive decision to not engage in debate anymore, uh, maybe uh, five, six years, uh, months ago. And uh, I'm not sure if you noticed, but my presence on the forum has diminished. Uh, but it has diminished in the sense that I'm more like uh, proactive toward like I'm asking questions or uh, telling things that uh, push things forward, as opposed to Walter and I love debates. We, we just love debating. And we debate on a forum whenever we can, and we debate on a forum whenever we can. But that has happened less so in the last months because we kind of discussed and we, we said, if we, uh, if we it, it comes, it kind of percolates from the top, right? If we debate, everybody's going to debate, etc. But if we are for action, everybody's going to be for action. And um, I like to believe, and please confirm or deny if I'm, if, I'm, uh, if I'm right here, I like to believe that on the forum, things have been improving in the past couple of months. And, uh, you know, my hope is that they're going to continue to improve. In, in the sense that the forum should be a place for people to go who want to get work done. It's not a place for entertainment. Well, you know, work is entertainment for people with no life, right, like you and me, right? <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm saying, right? It's not, it's not like, uh, e, you know, e-weekly. Uh, it should be like a place where people go, I want to get this work done and I'm having this problem. Or, you know, this, there should be a place, it should be a place for productive stuff as opposed to a place for debating. Oh, Jesus, there's some discussions now, right now, on the forum, which are like ridiculous about, I don't know, gender equality and stuff, like really like out there, uh, completely off topic and, you know, with some comments that are really hurtful. So, um, you know, just navigate away from those. Do you, do you feel like there's a, uh, a process for people to give feedback on a tool like the forum, whether it's actually working for the types of communication that you expect and that everybody in the community expects? Um, I think so, but I, I think this is a sort of more a question for everybody else than me. Do you feel the forum is helping you get work done for the D language? Raise your hand. Uh, we have two questions from Twitter. OK. So first one. Uh, we'll save that one for the parking lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Thanks. Can you? So first one is uh, between, like, it's actually very on the topic uh, of what you have just talked about. Uh, it's more of a suggestion to consider something like Rust High Five Boat for assigning pull request reviewers. And I have just checked what the High Five Boat is, and it says something like the bot randomly chooses a person out of a small per repo whitelist and uses a GitHub assignment feature to make the pull request their responsibility. So. Is that for reviewing pull requests? Yeah. Uh, so no, for uh, assigning pull request reviewers. I'm not sure about the others, but the acoustics where I'm standing from is terrible. So what, from what was table. suggested uh, was that uh, there's a, a whitelist of reviewers and that there's a r random selection of 
who is supposed to review a pull request, something uh, okay. automated, uh, so that yeah. it spreads the, uh, the responsibility yeah. in a more scaled way. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Thanks to uh, the person who suggested that. That's a good idea. Maybe we all think wants... in the same way. Yeah. yeah. So Vladimir actually um, proposed something even a bit more automatic, which is like you get a pull request and then you look at the source code lines that were changed and you look Git at blame. Git, <laughs> Git blame, blame yeah. and then you look like who's in this area and yeah. notify this guy like, because actually, it's yeah. much more helpful if it's, yeah. We've been so yeah, don't refactor or else you'll be notified. <laughs> so so the, we've, we've been doing this. Uh, edited. Sorry. The yeah. person that previously worked on the file. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so we've been doing this informally at Facebook for years, and it, it's been successful. It, it's a good, it's a good okay. strategy. Thank and you. And second question so far, not directly related to release processes, but probably quite important. Um, how to deal with dick jokes made about Dlang every time when I mention that I'm programming in D? I can take that because I'm, you know, <laughs> it, it, it did happen to me. I know how to handle that. I promise. Please advise. You, whenever you don't see D, you don't say you say the D language. It's not much more effort on the facial muscles. It's actually a bit of workout. <laughs> you say the D language. You don't say D. That's it. Done. Problem solved. Should we make a short group exercise where we all say D language together? <laughs> the D language. D That's language. Right. D yes. language. Awesome. D language. D language. You're done. Should we go back to the parking lot quickly and take <laughs> that, that show of hands? How many people think that there is a good clear process to give feedback on communication tools like the forum? Who thinks the opposite? So, so that, like that probably that's a... 10% so ah, so said no and 10% said yes yeah, and so the rest are Everybody's abstaining. abstaining. <laughs> like 80% are abstaining. The rest are saying, what forums? <laughs> <laughs> we have forums. <laughs> so okay, if you didn't try the forum, forum.dlang.org and um, I really, I really want like folks who are following uh, online or, or the recording, I, I think you should go on forum.dlang.org to see what a really snappy and good quality online forum can be. Authored this guy. Do we have another question out there? Um, um, I like deprogramming in it myself, but whenever I try to talk to anyone about it, they always immediately start comparing to Go and Rust. Do you have any opinions on that comparison? Go and Rust. I could not hear the question. Go, compare D, Go, and Rust. Hype. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The question was, why do people always compare D to other languages, specifically Go and Rust, when introducing it to someone? Right. Well, be I, probably because everybody knows C and C++ and Go and Rust are also kind of the new kids on the block, so people want to know how they stack up. I think that's perfectly natural to want to compare because Go says that, you know, they're the greatest thing ever and Rust says they're the greatest thing ever and we are the greatest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's only natural, they, you know, and it's, and it's fun debating the merits of different languages. Um, just like it's fun, you know, if you're a Chevy man or a Ford man, you know. Mm. Um, they each have their strengths and weaknesses and their devotees, and uh, people love to talk about it. But and I also think the competition among the various languages makes them all better. Mm. What would you say are the areas where D really shines compared to these other languages? Where D really shines? Mm. Um, I'd say it's ability to express your algorithms in a way that's very pleasing to the eye and very easy to, uh, to write out. Um, I've seen, well, naturally, that's what I wanted it to do, is I wanted my code to be beautiful. I don't want it to look ugly. I don't want to use uh, weird hacks to get what I want done. I want to... I want my code to flow in a nice, straightforward manner, and I think uh, D, if you, uh, after a while and you learn how to use its features properly, gives you a lot of opportunity to making some really nice, uh, good flowing code. I, um, so this was uh, a very similar question was asked uh, on Twitter. Um, and so, you know, my answer to this is, uh, is a bit kind of non-conventional, if you wish. Um, so, you know, many years ago I wrote a book called Modern C Process Design. I assume some of, some of you uh, know about it. 
And uh, it, it was well received. It was a book that was like, oh, okay, so you can do these things in C++, and you know, this is very interesting. Um, it, it was a fairly influential book. Um, now, you know, some people kind of took that to heart and kind of continued, uh, continued there. But uh, I actually saw something else past that, that work. I saw there is sort of um, hard to explain. I, I, I saw that the, the, uh, the, the speck of light that you see in the wall there is not this much. It's not an LED. It's the sunshine outside going through the wall. So I want to get to the sun. I want to get to the, like, the, the ultimate uh, ability to do the kind of things that, um, that I glimpsed um, in modern C++ design. Um, I wanted to do things with static introspection and with compile time evaluation and with metaprogramming that are impossible, literally impossible in C++, or that are, you know, some of them are trivial and are very difficult in C++. And for many folks, uh, it's been this, uh, this thing like, well, I'm very happy I can do this in C++ because I can't do it in other languages. But my vision was and is that you, these are trivial things and are very hard to achieve in C++ or in any other language. And I wanted to get way up to the next level where I'm, I'm already had a whole talk about uh, bit fields, right? It was like a, a, great, a great use of something. It was my first thing, the first thing I wrote with, uh, with the metaprogramming in D, and I was very happy about it. Because it did something non-trivial, it did something difficult, and it did something that could not be done you know, in other languages. Sounds like for you, you want D to be ambitious. And from Walter, it sounds like it's a creative merit in the language. Right, we have different, uh, different takes on this, but that's the, definitely not. Uh, they're not, they're, not at, uh, you know, they're not at stake. They're not uh, contradicting each other. I just wanted to, to do like great metaprogramming in uh, any language. And w quite honest, whenever I see a new language, it's like, oh my god, this could be it. I'm like looking at Go, Rust. I'm, I'm looking at them, and they just, they're just missing the point. And what about you, uh, Martin and, and Vladimir? I what do you think? very conclude with what Andrew just said. So like my C++ background experience was also very, well, you can do a lot of things. Like actually, you can do everything, and then you spend hours on it, and then and either you end up with a dead end because something doesn't work at some point because you I don't know cannot pass numbers to no cannot strings. pass strings to <laughs> template arguments and whatnot, so you end up in dead ends or you end up with something that works but you can't show it to your colleagues or something because unreviewable and unmaintainable. And both of those are dead ends, and I've wasted just too much time on doing really trivial things in C++. Yes. It's, yeah. And it's not like Go or Rust would really enable those usages. I don't have much to add. Well, I started using D in 2006, and before that I used Pascal or Delphi. And I was like, dynamic arrays, which are just slices of memory, oh my god, this is awesome. And D has just kept improving and improving and improving since then, and I don't see myself stopping using it. It's the evolution of it that you think really shines. All right. Okay. I'm glad we didn't evolve out of Vladimir's taste. Yeah. I'm very happy to have him on team for this long. That's awesome. I have one question from me personally this time. So remembering your remark regarding lack of kind of core developers whose expertise, so we, which can review stuff, uh, what do you think like question and like a random idea at once? about running something like the internal summer of code where we'd have like m mentors from core developers transferring both their expertise and responsibility over some domains and like build up more of responsible developers from interested parties by sort of knowledge transfer program, something like that. Like a, like a training program or something. A kind of training program which implies also taking responsibility over what you are trained in. Hmm. Handover. The D handover. Uh, could you repeat? I, I can't hear. Yeah, he was from. suggesting uh, the topic we were discussing earlier about and trying to scale. And he was suggesting a program around that, maybe something um, summer related where you're handing over responsibilities and also training, um, kind of bringing people together. But something maybe similar to DCOMP, I guess. No, it's a kind of, uh, I see an analogy to like Google Summer of Code, where mm. you have like a student and a mentor. But here you would have like core developer and the person who wants to become a core developer. 
So thanks to the great um, organization of Craig Dilbury, um, we got like four Google Summer of Code slots this year, which, uh, which is really amazing. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you, Craig. And I'm, we, at least one person is here in the audience of those um, students, and we have some very talented people there, and we are already quite challenged to like really teach them. So um, we have a lot of mentors that work with those people, but it's like four students is quite a lot already. Yeah. So we might just stick with Google Summer of Code if that works for us. Perhaps that, uh, when those four go through that program, yeah. they'll be able to bring back their, their findings. This aspect worked, that aspect worked, this didn't. And then you'll know more if, if D language itself wants to create a similar program. Um, I have two related uh, announcements to make small. Um, one is this is uh, this may be as well the first uh, the the first so I'm doing training occasionally, and uh, C plus plus is the money. It's people pay ridiculous amounts to kind of just have me blabber to them things, um, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Um, but this is, is the first year in which um, there's like two, there's been two uh, day-long training sessions for D. There's been, there's been demand for that. And uh, apparently, you know, there's a profit sharing thing. So probably the, of the folks who are going to come, I'm going to get like uh, a share of that money. So it's going to be the first money made in D training maybe ever, which is awesome. Um, and the second announcement is, Oh, by the way, so the second event is going to be the NDC conference in Oslo. Just, uh, I think, registration is still open. So if you want to learn about the, you know, preaching to the choir, right? But the second small announcement is um, I'm, I'm in works. I'm negotiating with O'Reilly uh, a contract to develop a course on the D language that's going to be filmed, on, sort of um, streamed. And it's going to be, uh, again, an eight-hour long course. And, um, well... It, they're going to take care of the production, everything, and they're, they're, they're in for the money. They're not, uh, they're, you know, they're going to sell it, not uh, make it available for free. Uh, but anyhow, it's, going to, it's not only showing the re increasing interest in the D language among professional programmers, but also it's going to be a good resource that we can, uh, we can send uh, new users to. Does anybody in the audience have suggestions for other resources, <coughs> like the ones that we just heard from Mihail? Gautam, back there? So uh, maybe we could make a course on Coursera, because that's like uh, one of these MOOCs have become really popular of late. And we could have something like that on Coursera or one of these other MOOC platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was just a suggestion. Did you understand? The so suggestion was make a course on Coursera. It's a web application, so. website, can create content, interactive content, I believe, um, can be made available to people. And, you know, I actually, so this is not, it, this is kind of, should be a kind of an echo chamber because it should reflect, uh, this, these suggestions should reflect right back to all of you because uh, many of you are very good uh, engineers and very good deep programmers and you can, uh, you can help with these things, right? I think, uh, I think there's a great, the opportunity is, uh, is under a feet right now, it's scorching, don't you feel it, right? It's burning. So I, I, think, uh, I think we should all keep that in mind. But going back to um, what you said earlier with, about pull requests, reviewing, and uh, the meetups, I think it's actually a very interesting thing to have like user groups where you do actual, actual work on the compiler or something on the runtime or on Phobos, um, because people get stuck on certain things. And mm. like, yeah, even for meetups, like reviewing pull requests or something is some very interesting thing to do. That actually Great. would be a fun activity at a, you know, a D meetup to just pick ten pull requests and review them during it, or collaborative review them. That would be fun and uh, educational. I think that'd be great. There are uh, some venues that we know of in Berlin that, for, for things like this, provide free space. So we wouldn't even need financial support for it. I'm, I'm sure you can find uh, co-working spaces like that in, in other cities where where D developers live. So, I mean, if you're in a city and you know of a co-working space there, maybe you can set up a meetup um, and cool. review pull requests. So. Mm -hmm. I think Berlin is really ripe for a meetup. The, Martin, do you plan to organize some? No, we, we already, have, yeah, we we already have, one. have one, thanks to Ben Palmer, who organized very regularly. We have, um, yeah, like, 
quite a lot of people regularly attending that, making presentations and doing some interactive That's hacking. Great. It's like really, really interesting to go there. Great, um, thank you. It's, um, I don't know. You go to Meetup and find it. Great. You could have each, at each Meetup, you could have you know, the, the pull request of the week. Yeah. That's what <laughs> the you of the do week. as part of the agenda. <laughs> yep. That would be awesome. That, uh, Benjamin, right? Where is Benjamin? Yeah, your pull request should be pull request of the week, every week until it gets pulled. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> See, we've got 300 open pull requests. That's about six years. <laughs> <laughs> we talked a lot about scalability. Right? Oh, question in the back? Yeah? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, I wanted to ask, what's the plan with code.dlang.org, with the dub thing? There was some talk that it's, uh, it should at least show how it builds. And if the package is built, I think maybe it would be good to also um, have some kind of rating system in the packages, because uh, some packages are, uh, even if they build, they um, are unfinished. And I'm also uh, a, a bit guilty of that, like putting stuff on top that isn't really ready for public consumption so we could improve the uh, the face of D if we had some kind of rating or something. So that... So, um, first of all, we have to thank somebody else again for restarting the whole dub web page um, to make it aligned with the dlang.org page. I think it will be released very soon when the next version of dub comes out. Um, this doesn't functionally change the website and doesn't improve anything on searching or ranking and whatnot, but it's definitely very high up on our priority to make that more useful and to make it easier to understand which packages are of high quality, often used, have a good reputation and whatnot. Um, I tried to find somebody who wants to, to do a ranking algorithm for this for quite a while. It, it's kind of, well, you could come up with several figures. Water, suggested like being having a lot of different metrics and whatnot. I mean, there are lots of ideas. Somebody has to decide on a good ranking algorithm. Somebody was even giving a lightning talk about was, ranking uh, algorithms. Gautam, yeah. yeah. Where was Gautam? Do you want to build a ranking algorithm for, for, uh, for Deb? Right. A shrug? Like, whatever. That's not a no. <laughs> OK. All right. Microphone. Yeah. So downloads, yeah, definitely. So I'm sure there's no shortage of ideas, and probably we can uh, we can run some of them by Gautam. So um, it's all a matter of just doing Do, it. Yep, that's one thing. And the other thing is, of course, we want to integrate with all the great CI systems that are out there. So I don't know, like Travis mm -hmm. CI, Circle CI, AppVeyor, or whatever people are using <coughs> to show the results and make them part of um, the ranking, so that untested code or undocumented code, like or maybe we can create some automated code documentation, but um, yeah. I don't think it's it's really that helpful if we are testing software for, of somebody else. I think the people have to do it themselves, and then we can kind of rank those packages which are well tested yeah. higher, or have a nice code coverage or got nice code climate and whatnot. So, cool. Yes, Attila. Um, so when are we going to rely on defects and just make breaking changes with reckless abandon? Don't we do that all the time? <laughs> oh, by accident, I mean on purpose. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. I mean, obviously defects has to get to the point where you trust it 100% to always work, but right. that'd be awesome. So I, I discussed this a bit with... Um, with Brian Schott, the author of Defix. And um, his work stops at um, uh, name resolution. It doesn't do it. And uh, I suspect there are quite a few things that are going to need a name resolution. So uh, Defix is a good tool up to a point, and we want like, we want, like a tool that's right 100% of the time, no false positive or negatives. Um, I think Go has uh, had a terrific success with GoFix, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's a very good data point, and uh, congratulations to the Go team for, for uh, getting that um, 
that flying. Uh, for us, I think the first step is uh, is resting on, um, you know, essentially Daniel Murphy needs to separate, and there he is grinning year to year, um, needs to migrate the compiler into a library, which library should sit on dub, and of course be highly ranked, right? <laughs> Uh, so the compiler would itself, uh, the, the whole gamut of um, all the way parsing through name resolution through uh, maybe even semantic analysis. And once you have that front end uh, as a dub package, you can write other dub packages depending on it. And it's just a matter of uh, just writing a line in your configuration file and you're done. And you have the parser there. And once that infrastructure is going to be in place, which um, Daniel is very excited about, so he's, he's going to push for it, and I'm going to, to help him with that. Um, once that's done, the door is open to that kind of work. Looking forward to it. Didn't know he was working on that, so uh, don't do anything else. Um, so maybe one thing for that. Um, in the meantime, until we have like good tooling for that, I've hardly seen anything that couldn't be deprecated in the compiler if you give it some effort. So like even if it's like adding some hex in the compiler to work around it and have some deprecation period. But if you put some effort in it, then like almost any feature can be properly deprecated and guarded with warnings and whatnot without breaking code immediately. That worked out quite well. Cool. Others like John, yeah. Uh, without wanting to start a uh, big versus small standard library debate, um, is there some sort of clear vision of where the standard library stops. Because I work on you know, DLang science and um, certain bits of that, like the ND slice stuff that's just recently come in, um, sort of semi-originates from DLang science. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's a bit difficult to know what should go in and what shouldn't, and how much, because you know, we could just start stuffing std.experimental uh, or at least filling the review queue and overloading everyone. I, and quite I, a lot of it is a bit of a waste of time for people because you don't want it because it's beyond the scope. I think we had the very lengthy discussions about this in the forums already. And kind of the conclusion was like, obviously everybody has a different set of what he wants in there. But good candidates for Phobos are things that don't change. While bad candidates are things that change rapidly. So, I don't know, the latest styling CSS composition library might be completely out of date in the next year, but um, something like JSON changes very rarely. So everything that's like really basic fixed things should are good candidates for Phobos. And things that have like three different ways to do them might not be the best thing. So like you can do GUIs in so many different ways that I'm very skeptical if it's a good idea to standardize them. Um, I have a couple of strong opinions on that. Uh, first of all, we have two fail failures in the library I don't <coughs> want to repeat. One of them is uh, the zip library and the other is curl. Um, I don't think we should incorporate anything in Phobos that is not 100% D and 100% boost licensed. I think uh, the curl and the zip libraries have been a problem, especially the curl one, and we should not be doing that anymore. Um, the Can you explain shortly why you think that? Um, because they're controlled by other people. So mm -hmm. they're on their own schedule of being updated, number mm -hmm. one. Um, when they don't work, it's very difficult for us to fix them because mm -hmm. nobody, has, nobody has any expertise on it. And, you know, they're in C. And, you know, we should be having stuff in, uh, in D, not in C, and they also don't, they have a license that's different from the boost license, so there's just, is, there's just an impedance mismatch in there, and it's not smooth, and we should not have more of that in there. Um, the other kind of thing I really object to, and it's a constant battle, is to not have one-line functions in Phobos. Um, we do not want Phobos, or at least I, do not want Phobos to be a mile wide and an inch deep. Mm -hmm. We don't want large quantities of functions that do trivia. We want functions that do something uh, deep and important, something that is not one line to implement. Um, a good clue that it's not a candidate for Phobos 
is if you've got more lines saying what the function does than its implementation, because then it's just easier to write it yourself than it is to search in the library for something. Mm -hmm. So I want things that are not trivial in the library, like regex is not trivial. It's very mm -hmm. hard to get it, very hard to do right. That should be in the library. Some of the algorithms in there, an STDL algorithm, they're not <laughs> trivial algorithms. They're hard to get right. Um, those kind of things belong in the standard library. Um, in the past, there's been in Phobos uh, cosecant, which is uh, the reciprocal of cosine. Why well, have a function in there that's the reciprocal of the cosine? It just doesn't, it's trivial. So you want solutions to the bigger problems in Phobos? Yeah, I don't, I don't want hmm. A, a giant amount of documentation documenting all this trivia and meanwhile things that do real work are not done and not in the library. Okay. So those two things I kind of feel strongly about. Where would you suggest if someone is working on smaller problems, and that is probably a stepping stone for people as they, they gain their experience with D, where would you suggest those should live uh, directly in their own projects or? Directly in your own projects. Like, if you're writing a function to have an extreme example, multiply x by 2, and that's the name of your function, and its implementation is x times 2. And I mean, it, it sounds ridiculous to have a, a function like that, but I've seen proposals for functions that are about that level of complexity, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff just doesn't belong. I wrote a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, if you spend more time documenting it than you do writing the function, then you're, you know, that's a giant red flag that it doesn't belong in, in the standard library. So I think a, a direct and honest answer is uh, there is no clear, there is no clear line. This, this is what you asked, right? Exactly. So uh, there's no clear line. And uh, it's a matter of judgment, and it's a matter of taste, and it's a matter of us all, like, deciding what's, what's what, right? Um, is there a description somewhere? of the standard library and kind of what the expectations or vision are? Because it was just said so clearly now. Maybe well, that, that's not available to everyone who wants to contribute to it. We'll refer people to this video. <laughs> the recording. Awesome. We have it. Yeah, we have it. It's producing right now. Um, so yeah, go ahead. I'll put it in a contributing MD file. We have that in the repo. Right. So you know, we're getting better at it. Um, my opinion is that um, there's a bunch of stuff there that has been, um, you know, Accumulating by accretion, and um, the, the, again, there's a lot of uh, good work in it, and uh, it should be great work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, uh, but I'm sure it can get better, and I'm sure it will get better. Yes, Shai. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, if the idea is to split out the front end into a library, is also an idea like a long-term vision to split out the back ends into a library, and then have some magical wrapper front-end program that where you can basically say, give me the front-end and back-end GDC or back-end DMD or back-end LDC. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go the lengths to split up the front-end and then have some glue code in it, it should be probably trivial to bind to the back-ends. At least for GDC, they are sort of becoming a library. LLVM is basically a library by design, and uh, I guess the same could be done for the DMD back-end. And that actually, I think, would increase the speed of the D development quite a lot. So is there any such idea, or is this just like some wack idea I just had? Well, uh, my pull request for the last few months, uh, a lot of them have been aimed at improving the encapsulation of things. Um, and that definitely moves it in that direction. The better we can enca encapsulate things, the better we can define interfaces, um, avoiding arbitrary random de dependencies on how something is implemented, uh, the easier it's going to be to achieve that goal. Also, Daniel's work is a stepping stone toward that, that goal. So, so that is the goal. Right. OK. Yeah, we're on it. Um, one comment on uh, Phobos. I also think that uh, Phobos should not contain trivial things. And I should that etc.c.star should go. So uh, zlib should go, curl should go, and uh, SQLite should go. Because Make it go. Be because, yes. be be because those are basically outdated header files. And yeah. Not to uh, interrupt at all, but maybe that, that level of detailed discussion 
maybe it would get actually lost in a, in a forum like this where we have limited time. And maybe it's better to record that down in writing and, and to discuss those at another place. I could be wrong, but I think that might, be, might have more impact. I think so, too, yeah. There's no more questions now. Yeah, yeah and <laughs> there are more questions as well. Yeah, well, I mean, unfortunately, it's again about the uh, functions with trivial implementations. So they sometimes do solve a non-trivial problem, and that is they uh, standardize the name of those functions. I mean, I, I think uh, many D programmers have like small utility libraries by the side that contain all the uh, functions that are missing from Phobos that have uh, trivial implementation and they all name them differently, or, if they na or maybe they will name them the same and then they will conflict in case the projects get combined. No, I'm, I'm You're suggesting a naming convention for Phobos? No, I'm saying uh, I even if something has a, a trivial implementation, it can solve a non-trivial problem, and that is uh, it standardizes the name of this functionality. Okay, yeah, yeah he was saying that even if something are trivial functions, then having those on standard library standardize the, standardize the name. So like, if you read the code that somebody does, like, I mean, we had a really long discussion about whether to add drop to ranges or not, because right. drop is a really trivial thing. You do right. pop for it, and then you return the range, right? And as you say, it standardizes the name, and now you have like drop and drop exactly, and you can kind of nicely combine them right. with ranges and yeah. have a chain. So or, or they fold do is another some good example. Fold. Like yeah. reduce, like fold is reduced with the right order because reduce was introduced before, uh, before the universal syntax. So, yeah, uh, you know, uh, let, uh, just a quick answer. Um, Walt, we're not bigots here. Um, we're not? You know, no. for example, we talked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're not. We're not kind of. I think a really bad position in uh, in this kind of in this line of work is to be. Uh, uh, to be too rigid. Rigidity is bad. So you don't want to be too rigid. You want to always have kind of a way to kind of say, you know, be reasoned with. And Walter and I were discussing about this, uh, the, his one-liner rule, which I agree with. Uh, but he didn't say never. He didn't say that there should be never a one-liner or two-liner in the standard library. There should never. He didn't say that. He said requires executive review. Yeah, and I said a one-liner, you know, also a red flag. Yeah, it's a red flag, but I do agree that at some point the frequency, like in fold, the case of fold, right? The frequency with which the, the uh, facility is needed trumps its, uh, its triviality. I guess it depends on how many characters are in that one line, too. That kind of stuff, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so I have a next question. Um, we heard today from the Vecca guys that they had an enormous amount um, of performance they got from switching from DMD to LDC. Um, I work with Ilya on MIR, so the numeric library, and we have about four to five times an increase in speed and the, uh, the binary produced with LDC. Um, my question is, currently LDC is running with um, the 0 0.17, is running with the a uh, version which is like nine or uh, ten months old. There is already a uh, better available, um, which is um, based on a 2.70 um, front end. But I, I think it, or well, as a young user to Phobos and to, to uh, D, I do understand that it might be hard to bind to the front end, but definitely not the Phobos standard library. And there was an issue like two or three weeks ago where Rhinos discovered that the next power function in Phobos was uh, processor-specific. And it took them a long time to discover that the standard library people messed something up. So my question is, can we um, combine the efforts and, for example, have uh, LDC and GDC tested with the latest Phobos every time? Looking at each other. <laughs> Awkwardly. <laughs> okay. Nobody wants to take that day. question. <laughs> is there anything that, yeah. Any, <laughs> so yeah, I I think that's that's a really good goal. Um, we can't do it at the moment because the front ends aren't really swappable yet. So there's this big glue layer in between, which is very back end specific, and it it just goes back to this uh, earlier thing. Like Daniel and Ian are working quite a lot on 
trying to make it more independent and it's a bit at odds with certain performance requirements so like arguing endlessly about pull requests and whether to do it this way or that way like being having a plug and play front end or having a faster thing but um, ultimately we want to have that because the, the effort of porting is really big at the moment I mean there are giant merges that the people have to do and then do all the adaptions so the goal is really to get everything that's compiler specific into Phobos and the runtime themselves rather than having them separately in GDC and LDC and also to make the front end as compatible with everything as possible. And then this is the thing you need to do so you can check pull requests against other backends. And as a short follow up question, um, I just quickly talked with David yesterday and is there anything that would be against uh, uh, moving LDC and GDC to the official GitHub namespace of Dlang? Um, so I, I could not hear the question. So he, he, uh, he asked uh, whether it would be a good idea to uh, move GDC and LDC to the official Dlang namespace, if that would help. Not sure, maybe. We had for some time, we had some visibility problems of not really seeing what the LDC and GDC people are doing, or like now there's STC as well. So like, we don't really get that, and so people were patching Phobos and the runtime all over the place in their compilers, but we never knew. Um, so yeah, maybe it would help if we had like more, would get like more overview, some, oh yeah, they're, they're making lots of pull requests about this issue, maybe we can help them by You're integrating. Lacking some internal communication. People were saying earlier, asking questions and realizing that things were being worked on that they didn't know about. Right. Mm. Yeah, I agree. That's a problem. I don't know what to do about it. Go on the forum. <laughs> you know, if, um, sometimes I hear about things happening only at these conferences. <laughs> Have more conferences. I, I, yeah, no, I think actually the solution is very simple. You talk, talk more often to each other, so maybe we should have a compiler meeting once a month or so with the people just an hour on Skype or so just to update each other what, what they're actually trying to go, where, where people are trying to go. Simple as that. Cool. Hi. Uh, hey, oh, um, sorry. Which uh, part of the D ecosystem do you think requires more attention at the moment? Mm. <laughs> All, of, All <them>. of it. <laughs> <laughs> there's, it. There's a never ending uh, um, a list. I've been taking notes while I was here of you know action items for me, and it's already uh, gotten quite long. Well, it's like um, you said earlier. If you suggest things for people to do, it might not be as inspiring and motivating as if people do what what they're being called to or what they're right. passionate about. Yeah, definitely. Um, people who've had success in working in the D organization have kind of felt the calling. <laughs> And they've, they've felt impelled to do certain things and have self-selected themselves they weren't assigned. Uh, I do think there is, a, there is a different angle on that same question, which is very interesting. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, th there is a notion of most bang for the buck. And a, a sort of re reframe of his question would be, um, where do you think uh, there's most bang for the buck in, the, if, you know, for a given number of talent times hours, for example, where would that talent should be put to get most return? And I think there is, a, there is an easy answer and a precise answer to that is the, five, the first five minutes. I think it doesn't require much expertise to, do, to, to write a tutorial. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. In the back with the beard. Yes, he started it. That was some golf clap. Yes, OK. Yeah. <laughs> so the first five minutes, and as Liran said, and this is a great one-liner. The first five minutes b become the next five years. It's like, you know, I need to do this thing. I've got five minutes to make a decision. And it's like, oh, go is great. It's, I can do a, I can paste this code into mine, tweak it, and I get something going, right? So that was a great narrative they got, right? They have a good story there, right? Great. We don't have it, although we do have, I mean, we kind of win the academic debate. <laughs> you know, we win a debate. We don't win the first five minutes. We don't take the prompting home, right? We don't, we, we don't get the result, right? We don't do that. That's what we need to focus on, and that's, it doesn't require a genius to write a tutorial. 
It doesn't require a genius to fix something on the site when you see it. That's wrong. Uh, we have, you know, I'm, I'm not kidding. There's artifacts on the site at this moment in Phobos, in the standard library, that are, have no examples. Would you believe that? It's amazing. Uh, you got to think of it. Like, there's like, you know, a, a bunch of people looking at, a lot of eyeballs looking at that doc documentation. You know, it's like, ah, this is not documented. Maybe I'll go write some Go. <laughs> right? so, so we have... We have time for a couple more questions. Uh, wait, uh, I actually wanted yeah. to say something to that. Um, so um, I don't think we have like we need to do everything. So we had also a forum discussion at some point, like what's the most important issues do you need to fix before it's like feature complete? And that's actually a very short list uh, of stuff to do. Um, I, I might have an unofficial shortlist for myself. So like the most important things to do is really making the dub experience better for people. Um, Which is part of the five, five, first five minutes. Yes, exactly. Um, getting a CTFE interpreter to not leak so much memory. Um, like reworking template instantiation is an important topic. And well, personally for me, I think we should integrate tuples into the language at some point, but other people disagree. and. Yeah, well, getting rid of all those C bindings in the runtime, like the ha making the hash table real native type and whatnot. So that's like the short list. And besides that, we have a backlog on, on the Trello page, which includes a lot of reasonably sized project ideas for doing stuff. And yeah, but just like my, my short list. Yeah, Walter, should include things like the C process interface? Um, yes. And, but also, a lot of people come up to me in this conference and said, you know, how about this idea? And they're all great ideas. And, you know, I kind of had to say, well, I can't implement them now because, or in the early future, because there's just so much going on right now that we absolutely have to get done last month. And, you know, that's really hard. And the hardest part of my job is saying, no, I can't do that feature. Sounds like one of the main themes of actually this panel, this discussion, is scalability. That's coming up a lot, and also communication. How about, how about mm -hmm. your list, Vladimir? You have a nice list. Oh, well, my, two, my list is mostly about the infrastructure and you know, making all the testing on building and stuff uh, a lot smoother and you know, automating pinging people on GitHub and things like that. There's still and there's definitely a list of things to improve there. Uh, my short list has. Um, Writing a dip for the, for the reference counting. Um, coming with the reference counter string as a proof of concept. Um, and next would be kind of implementing, you know, working with Walter, I mean, actually telling Walter to do it, to implement the reference counting, <laughs> uh, testing it, and uh, containers. So that would be the, the next uh, big thing. So, um, you know, a, a bit of everything, but not, not, it's not an exhausting, it's not a huge list and it's not unstructured, it's not, you know, I think we uh, are pretty focused right now, much more so than last year to kind of bring uh, a previous question. Uh, not, much unlike last year, we're much more determined and focused and we have a larger core team here uh, to, um, to, you know, be on top of things. Speaking of the, the first five minutes, we are actually at the last five the last minutes five now. Minutes. <laughs> I have to kind of push that in, so let's go with one more question. Okay, it's not really a question, it's more like a request from Twitter. Please implement a stochastic optimizer in the compiler. Would love to see this in production. I don't think that's a question. Yes, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it was sent to AskTConf, so if anyone wants to comment on that, well, it's in the time. Implement what? Stochastic optimizer. And um, if someone else is as un uneducated as me, I have just checked in Google. So uh, I think that guy wanted to show that he knows what the stochastic optimizer <laughs> is. Yeah, uh, stochastic optimizer uses random search to explore the extremely high dimensional space of ah. all possible program ah, transformations. It's, yeah, um, really. it's <laughs> fairly simple to write your own optimization pass in LLVM. Just go forward. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's great. Right, I, I right. think uh, well, on a personal load, Super, yeah. I think we shouldn't implement really complex optimization passes in the DMD backend. It's really very time intensive to do this. And the reason of having the DMD backend is it's kind of simple and fast to compile. And it's like the reference compiler. It doesn't need to be the fastest on Earth. 
one more? Yeah, one more, because that wasn't a question. Oh, yeah, I, I just want to go back to the uh, discussion a few moments ago about uh, uh, communication and uh, bring up an idea I brought up the other day about uh, an official D blog. Mm. Uh, also not a question. Uh, well, <laughs> it's an idea, right? Okay. Right. Well, I just, I just want to know what you guys think about that because I, I think it would be a good place to uh, 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 coordinate uh, everything going on as, as, uh, mm. uh, uh, to highlight projects, uh, big projects in the community to highlight what's going on with LDC, with GDC, all in one place, in one feed. Uh, yeah, th this week in D is, is a summary. Uh, and I'd like you know, to see something with, with more details uh, uh, about what people, uh, you know, once every few weeks to have a post from the uh, core D team uh, to see what's going on. Because Rust, Go, everybody has official blogs. We don't have an official blog. Yeah, so I'm just wondering what you guys think about that. Uh, we should write more. Um, Your emails are extremely eloquent, Andrea. <laughs> Why, thank you. Well, yes, I used to write a regular blog for Dr. Jobs, but uh, they uh, kind of went out of business, and with that, my sort of motivation <laughs> to write the blogs. But uh, yeah, I should keep uh, keep doing that. Um, what, what, the closest thing I can think of, um, again, I'm thinking of minimizing my energy consumption here. I think that the closest to this would be uh, Adam uh, Rupes, uh, Adam D. Rupes, uh, this week in D. And I think we can work with him to, uh, to, for him to become the official voice of, uh, of the core team. And by the way, so, sorry, I don't want to be exclusive here. So there are folks on the core team who are, who are not here, like Daniel and, and Ian and, uh, and a few others. So I just wanted to specify this so they don't feel uh, left out. So this is not the only, the only folks who are on the core team. So Just those, to not cause confusion, I am not on the core team. <laughs> so <laughs> so those, that, that wasn't a question. So we've we got to take one more question. Who has one question? Final one. Shai, master of ceremonies. Can we sorry, take a final sorry. one? Hello. Actually final. Uh, I have one question, though. What do you think when you get these half of millions in Bavian dollars, uh, what do you think about hiring somebody like Steve Klubnik in Rust? I think I got his name right. Are you somebody like whom? Uh, the guy in Rust community who does the like documentation and everything, uh, keeping up with the community, with the broader community. Right. You know, while you're busy doing reference counting, he does all the you right. know marketing and and uh, first five minutes things. <clears throat> Uh, I think that's a great idea, and I'm actually keep uh, I'm actively um, considering that. Um, essentially, like the the, uh, the the, the dynamics right now is uh, there's an offer on the table, there's uh, money may be available uh, provided the right um, provided the right plan and the, the right vision, and um, you know the way I see it is money is a way to scale to scale up. A lot of businesses just do do that. You know, it's just the money is a way to scale up. It's a, it's a way to uh, buy the things you don't have the time to to build. Uh, and I plan to uh, aim in that direction by, um, you know, and that includes things like, you know, wh why don't we hire someone, somebody who, who can do this, this for us? And there's already a lot of projects on the table that, uh, that are uh, vying for that, uh, for that um, uh, position. So, yes, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great thought. Thank you. With that, we have to close the panel. We're sneaking in one last question? All right, if Shai says yes, then we're sneaking in. Uh, he got his, yeah. All right, also not quite a question. Uh, <laughs> not allowed, man. <laughs> We'd like we need to, to end on a question. Uh, uh, regarding uh, communication, I actually feel that the forums are quite verbose. For me, it's extremely difficult to follow because mm. we just have two categories. You have the announce, which is okay, but you don't get the content, and then you get the general, and everything like pours in there, and and it's very difficult to follow on the important thing. So I think, at least for me, if there were like a language sub forum where mm. actual D things are discussed, and maybe a library sub forum where the library is discussed, and then general, when people have their uh, problem or they want to talk about something, and the newbies or whatever, they'll go to different places, and people will be able to channel their efforts. So I, I try to establish a few things in that area. So we'll have now a 
sort of clean DMT internal lists, mailing lists that we're using for that purpose. And we have a very somewhat unregular, but like above monthly sprint reviews, so to say. Um, internally, a few of us are using Trello to, to track their project, and we have some sort of monthly discussion of what, what was there, what um, is planned for the next month, and how the time is allotted. Um, I'm trying to establish this. It's like it didn't yet have too much grip, but it's like it's at least a starting point. So I hope more people will join there and actually participate in this. Get in there. Yeah. To be technical, I mean, there is a runtime mailing list and a Phobos mailing list and a DMD internals mailing list. I'm not saying they are, you know, the perfect tool right now, the solution to your comment. They're there, and they know that, for example, you have to subscribe to the mailing list first in order to post, or you can't post through the web interface at forum.org. And there is a lot of noise because all the GitHub pull requests get mirrored there. But if there is demand, I think we could... Uh, well, the, the GitHub pull request is no longer go on DMD internals. We fixed that. Oh, at least. Great. Yeah. There's too much. There's too much traffic. In in too much well, traffic. We should in have fact, uh, having a mailing list where you need to sign up is one of the reasons why it's it's a better communication infrastructure for us internally. Right. It, it um, makes it unusable for me, basically. As a as a DMD internals consumer in L, okay. in LDC, hmm. I Maybe really much rather the, have them the, as a forum. Maybe we should start from the other and like add um, uh, off topic. Like a, oh. a forum called off topic. And whoever, you know, go to off topic whenever there's like Nick Sabolowski starting some rant, you go off topic, you know? I think it's really good that this was raised and it should spark discussions yeah. Yeah, once totally. these four come off stage. You shouldn't think that just because they're here that now is the only time that you should talk. Um, as Andre said at closing yesterday, like everybody come up and shake his hand. Well, do more than that, come up and, and knock him over the head. And, Tell them what you think and, and, and give your opinions. So with that, we'll have to close the panel. So can you give these guys a hand for sitting up there? Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. You're awesome. You're great.